Good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Rush. Uh, I'm Eric Isaacs, president of the Carnegie Institution for Science, and really honored to welcome you here tonight uh, for a capital science evening. Uh, the title tonight uh, is Slow, Energy Efficient, and Mysterious Life Deep Within the Earth's Crust. And it's a really intriguing title for what I think is going to be a really uh, fascinating uh, talk. We're particularly pleased, proud even to host Dr. Karen Lloyd here as our speaker. Um, Dr. Lloyd is part of the Deep Carbon Observatory, uh, an international consortium of more than 1,000 scientists. And as its name suggests, the DCO, the Deep Carbon Observatory, was created to investigate carbons buried beneath uh, the Earth's surface. Um, that's about 90% of the Earth's carbon. Uh, the Deep Carbon Observatory was launched 10 years ago by uh, Robert Hazen, who's sitting here in the audience with us. And he's a senior, senior staff uh, scientist here at Carnegie Institution's Geophysical Lab, and it was done in partnership with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So since that time, Carnegie has served as the home of the DCO Secretariat, a team of staff that has provided leadership, management, and oversight of the project. Uh, I, I should also mention that the Sloan Foundation President, Adam Falk, is here tonight, um, and we're very grateful for their decade of commitment. So the Deep Carbon Observatory has been an extraordinary example of collaborative science. Um, the DCO brings together geologists, chemists, physicists, even biologists, and, and, uh, and, and biologists working with geophysicists is sort of a, a great idea. I don't think it's that new, but it's really remarkable how well this has worked. Um, and it demonstrates the powerful results that scientists can achieve when we break down the silos that are so traditionally between us to do things that are really uh, remarkable and new. And so we're going to hear some about that tonight. So tonight we'll be hearing about research based on Dr. Lloyd's investigation of volcanoes and hot springs in Costa Rica. Her work, um, her work was part of the Deep Carbon Observatory's so-called 12-day sampling expedition in that country. Uh, that field uh, initiative was designed to enable researchers to identify and understand the novel connections between microbiology, volcanic systems, and the cycling of living and dead carbons as Earth's plates move and subduct past each other. It seems quite appropriate that Dr. Lloyd's fieldwork focuses on the locations where geological boundaries converge. Her research crosses the disciplinary boundaries of geomicrobiology, molecular biology, and geochemistry. A little about Dr. Lloyd's background. She, her academic career began with her bachelor's degree in biochemistry at Swarthmore. Uh, she did her master's and PhD in marine sciences at the University of North Carolina and went to a postdoc in geomicrobiology, excuse me, at Aarhus University in Denmark. She has been honored with a number of prestigious fellowships, including a NASA Early Career Fellow, Simon's Early Career Investigator in Marine, bio, microbi, in marine microbio, uh, Microbial Ecology and Evolution with an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow, uh, and a Cavalier Fellow uh, of the US National Academy of Sciences. And that's just the beginning, I'm sure. Uh, she is based at the University of Tennessee, where she serves as an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology, but her fieldwork has taken her all over to Costa Rica, the Baltic Sea, Norway, Siberia, and the Marianas Trench seamounts. In her worldwide search for marine microbes, she has clung to the sides of volcanoes, worked under the midnight sun on the edge of the Arctic Sea, uh, and sampled hot springs in Argentina's Andes Mountains. So like all of you, I am very much looking forward to hearing uh, her, her uh, from this distinguished and even intrepid explorer and scientist. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Lloyd. Thank you. OK, so I, I want to tell you guys about um, what life is like inside Earth, um, but I'll just point out my backdrop of my title slide is from the Andes. This is our most recent research trip um, to the volcanic arc of the Andes. Um, but really, I'm going to talk mostly about subsea floor sediments, what's underneath the oceans. But we'll come back to volcanoes. And hopefully, by the end of this, you'll see the connection between those two things. This is my favorite view of Earth. 
<laughs> if you ever take Google Earth and just flip it around from the way we normally look at it, you can actually pick a view that is almost all ocean on obviously the Pacific Ocean. Um, and this really drives home what we kind of all, the statistic that we all know that 75% of Earth's, Earth is covered by oceans. Um, it's really true. So if we're talking about life that is buried within Earth, then most of it is going to live underneath our oceans. So some colleagues of mine have actually quantified the number of cells, microbial cells and bacteria and archaea, that we think are living in these deep subsea floor sediments. And what they came up with was 10 to the 29 living microbial cells buried underneath our oceans. And I know that that order, order of magnitude is kind of hard to think about, so to put it in perspective, this is about a third of the microbes on the planet. Um, and if you compare it to the number of stars in the whole universe, um, which is not well known, but the estimate um, says that this is about 10,000 times more than the number of stars in the universe. Um, so really, when we talk about life on Earth, we really should be talking about life inside Earth, because that's where much of it is. So how we go about learning about this life inside Earth is, first of all, we go out into nature and get samples. And, I mean, frankly, this is why a lot of us do it. Um, sometimes people ask me, um, well, certainly you're in your laboratory and people just bring you things. Like, no, <laughs> this is the point. <laughs> um, so we go to awesome places and get cool samples, and then we measure all the chemicals in these samples as much as we can to try to get at what food these microbes might be eating or what they're breathing, what they're respiring. <clears throat> And then another really common thing we do to study them is that we pull out, we chemically pull out DNA and other biomolecules, just all the parts and pieces of a cell, directly from these samples. And then we can also bring them back to our home laboratories and grow them. So one way that we collect these samples when they're underneath the, the oceans is with the Joides resolution. Um, this is a drill ship with this massive drill stack here. Um, and so when you go out on these expeditions, there are long pipes um, built up on the stack, and you basically send them to the seafloor sea on a long string and then fire a little explosion at the seafloor, and these enormous pipes just shove into the sediments. And then you can bring up layer after layer of, of mud and get these really deep samples. So, and then we can work with them on the ship. So when we do this, when we get these samples, if we want to look for the microbes, um, we actually have a lot of options for what kind of microbes we expect to find. Um, because you may or may not know, there are lots and lots of different microbes on this planet. Um, this is a picture I found on the internet. I didn't make it, um, but I really love it. Um, this is just somebody's handprint, presumably before they washed their hand. Um, <laughs> and actually, I think this is a cool picture, too, because you can see this, um, this colony down here. This guy was making some serious antibiotics, because look at that ring around it. It just like ate everybody around it. But this is just to illustrate that there's just many, many microbes that we know about. It's a vast array. And you should also note, I mean, we think of microbes as causing disease, and of course they do. Um, but if you can put your hand down on a Petri dish and get that many different things to grow, presumably this person wasn't dying. I mean, they probably didn't get infected from this. So really, most of the things on us are not killing us. They're not pathogens. Um, it's only a subset of these microbes that have figured out how to kill us. Um, although I will point out that in evolutionary history, in the total the span of Earth history, um, we, humans, have only showed up re relatively recently compared to microbes, which have been around for at least 3.8 billion years. So I'm going to put yet on there. <laughs> Give them some time. They'll get there. So we, armed with hundreds of years of microbiological research, said we know a whole lot about microbes on this planet. Let's go to our first samples that we ever got from the deep subsurface. Um, it was, they were taken off the coast of Peru. This is the first time we really used aseptic sampling techniques so that we could be sure that we weren't contaminating our samples and we could believe in what we, what we got. And luckily, this, is, um, this was my first project that I got handed as a PhD student. And that was pretty cool to get entrusted with these awesome. I was not the only one, only one working on them, but it was, uh, it was a pretty heady time. And I will tell you um, what I was doing was extracting the DNA, and I'll tell you what we found. I'll tell you who we found, which kind of microbes, um, but I'll extract the data and show it to you in this form, where I'll make a box every time we got a different microbe. And if it's dark blue, that means it's similar to what somebody already knew before. It would be closely related to one of the ones that grew on that handprint, for instance. And then if the box is completely white, that means that it's 
a new phylum. So a phylum is a very high level of, back, high level of taxonomic hierarchy. Um, you can think of a phylum as um, uh, we're chordata. Everything with a backbone is in a single phylum. So this would be like discovering a new phylum. Um, so what we caught were all these different boxes. And each one represents a major group of microbes that we found with the DNA sequences. And you can see some of them are pure white. <laughs> So we were discovering novel phyla that no one knew anything about. It was very fun. Um, and some of them were a little bluer, but really, we knew we were going to an exotic place, and now we had exotic microbes to match. This is low-hanging fruit for a microbiologist. Now we just grow them. I mean, everything that's there is something really new, so let's get them growing on petri dishes and study them. So luckily, there were a couple of labs that were experts at growing microbes out of um, marine sediments. And so I'll show you the ones that they managed to get to grow. And every one that they get, I'll, I'll do the same thing. So I'll put a box underneath. If they caught like this one, there'll be a box underneath it. And any new ones that they found that weren't in our DNA sequences will be over to the right. And I'll use the same color. So dark blue are going to be ones we kind of knew before. White ones are like totally crazy new stuff. OK, you ready to see what the, the people growing things got? <laughs> they didn't get anything that we found with the DNA. Nothing, zero overlap. And they're all blue. <laughs> it's all stuff we knew about before. Um, often people say to me, like, oh, you should grow them under pressure. Um, people have tried that, too. Um, I'm not saying that these can't be grown ever, but they were not growable by these methods on that day. And actually, the second lab, that was their result. So um, we had a major problem, which was also intriguing. And this has sort of led us and some other folks to call this stuff microbial dark matter, um, because kind of like astronomical dark matter, it seems to be everywhere. It's really, really common, and maybe even the dominant form of microbiology on this planet, um, but we can't say what it is. It's just like something totally new. Um, because there's all these new microbes down there, I would like to go back to Microbiology 101. And these are a couple of things that you will learn in any introductory microbiology class. Um, microbes grow in cultures. We grow them on petri dishes, we grow them in flasks, and we kind of have a handle on what microbes do on this planet and for this planet. The discovery of all this weird stuff out there really means that this is a frame of reference. This is not necessarily the truth. We have to see it for what it is, and it may be true, but it may not be. So it means that when we think about what this life is like in deep within the planet, we kind of have to take ourselves outside of it. Um, so let's throw out the, the frame of reference and think uh, from the microbe's perspective. So if we think about this, if you're a microbe, so um, you settle on the seafloor, you somehow get to the top of, of the muck, so just imagine the bottom of the ocean, kind of like fluffy stuff, um, and then just slowly, slowly gook, crap, poop from fish rains down on you over time, and over hundreds of years, thousands of years, millennia, you are pushed down and down and down and down. And what things are going to look like for you are, this is my stylized view of seawater up here and then sediment. The best things to breathe, like we only breathe oxygen, right? That's it for us. If we don't have that, we're dead. But microbes can breathe lots and lots of things. Um, so the oxygen is used up pretty quickly, and after that they can breathe nitrate, they can breathe almost all the transition metals that we can, if they're redox active. So iron, manganese, and then sulfate, and they can even breathe carbon dioxide, which is crazy, but the energetics actually, actually work out, and it's a, it's a common thing that microbes can do. Um, but what this means is that as you get buried, there's decreasing oxidation potential. So the power that you get from breathing gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you get buried. You have to combine this with the fact that there's no new food that gets delivered. You have to eat the same stuff that you got buried with. So you combine this with decreasing organic matter or food quality. So this equals a pretty crappy life. Um, there is massively decreasing energy available for these organisms. So we predict from this that the number of microbial cells should really decrease in a massive way with depth. This is what should be. And it just so happens that we now have quite a bit of data that we can compile about the number of microbial cells with depth, and we can test this hypothesis and see if it's true. 
in it is absolutely true. So this is a compilation of microbial cell numbers. Um, depth is on the y-axis here. This would be like the sediment interface right here. This is the top of the seafloor, and then going way, way down into the earth. And it's, this is a log plot. So this is actually a huge decrease. It doesn't matter what ocean you go to. This is worldwide. Everything is decreasing as it gets buried. It's going down and down and down. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that these things aren't growing. They could just be growing. It's just supporting fewer of them at each layer. So we then have to ask the question, well, how fast are they actually growing in these sediments? Are they doing something? Um, and for reference, E. coli, which is the lab rat that, you know, everybody's got some in their lab, um, it has a doubling time of 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, the cells double, and you can get a nice culture over a single night. So if we look at the sediment ages as it gets buried, so um, starting at the top, um, we go down a few meters and get 100 um, years old, and then all the way down at the bottom of the data that I'm going to show you is about 5,000 years old. And to get that much um, sediment to be that old in this particular example that I'm going to show you, that would be basically from the top of the ceiling to the floor. So it's about seven meters um, into the seafloor. You get down to sediments that are about 5,000 years old um, in this one, one place. So my colleagues figured out the growth rates of these organisms based on the energy, energy that was available for them. And what they found relative to E. coli is that up at the top, this 100-year-old sediment, things were already a lot slower than E. coli. Their generation time was not 30 minutes. It was more like a few months. But then if you look at everything as it gets deeper and deeper, they slow way down. Down at the bottom, these things are only dividing, these cells are dividing, if they're even dividing at all, once every 50 years or something like that. Um, these are incredibly long-lived cells. In fact, they may not even be dividing at all. They may just be replacing broken parts over time, slowly. Um, so if you add this up and see how much do the cells actually grow, um, the generation time, the t cumulative number of cell generations with depth, you find that, yep, they're adding on cell generations, but once things get this slow, <laughs> there's really nothing. So it means that for the past 2,500 years, 2,400 years, these cells did not increase or decrease. They just kind of sat still the whole time, which I think is extraordinary. I mean, that's a really, really strange way to be, um, but it led my very first graduate student, Jordan Bird, who now has his PhD, to say this. It's not a biome, Karen. It's a diome. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> He's totally right. All right, so like, you've all come to see a lecture about something interesting, right? If this ecosystem is just dying, why am I spending my entire professional life studying this? And why are we all here? Like, what's the point of this? It's just dead. It's just decaying. Um, which, you know, that's a fair point. <laughs> I think the fact that these things are so extraordinarily slow means that that biology functions in a fundamentally different way than we knew before. I think that this changes the basic rules of what governs the adaptation of these organisms to their environment. We are so used to the fast-paced world of, of microbes or of biology that's trying to, to win a race um, that maybe this whole system functions in an essentially different way. And I, that's why I do it. <laughs> um, I just think we're going to learn something really, really new about what they can do. And yeah, uh, so if we go to how we normally think about biology, to put this in perspective, the goal in most ecology is winning a race. You got it. Nature is red in tooth and claw. If you're not growing, you, someone's eating you. You got to get work to get ahead. And we actually, there's some nuance in this, of course. In ecology, we recognize our strategists an S strategist. So an R strategist is just a fast grower like E. coli. Just make as many cells as possible, gain a foothold, and then you're settled. But there's another ecological um, pathway too, which is the S strategist, the turtles, and they bide their time. They grow more slowly, and then they can often, but still, even with the turtles, even with the slow growers, the goal is to still beat the rabbit. They're still racing with that rabbit, and we know that the turtle can win, um, but it's still a race. What if it's not a race? These things aren't growing. What if their goal <laughs> is to exist? 
like my reference? Or, or abide. They just want to abide. <laughs> I think this is a different way to think about ecology, or at least it is for me. Um, how, do you, how do you conceive of the interactions of, an, of a community if no one's trying to win? <laughs> um, so these are all intriguing thoughts, and I decided to apply them to a cruise of opportunity that we were able to be associated with to the Baltic Sea. So this was not on the Joydis resolution. We went out on the great ship Manisha. Um, I actually did not go on this um, expedition. We got samples delivered to us by our colleagues. Um, this was a retrofitted um, ship for a drill stack. We couldn't take the Joides resolution in the Baltic simply because the bridge over uh, the Storbelt, the big bridge in uh, connecting Copenhagen to the rest of Denmark, is um, too short for the big ship. So we had to use a retrofitted ship. Um, and this is my student, Jordan Bird, did all this work. So um, give him full credit for having done this stuff. I'm just reporting it. Um, so we had this basic hypothesis. What are the potential mechanisms that allow bacteria and archaea, these microbes, to persist in a near zero growth state for 8,000 years, 50 meters deep into the Baltic Sea sediments? and we just didn't have any preconceived notions, let's just look and see what they might be doing. Keep our minds open. Um, so we used a pretty cool technique um, to do this, and I want to explain it to you because it's awesome. I didn't invent it, so I can um, crow about it. Um, it's called single-cell genomics. We have this essential problem. If we want to look at the genes that are present from an individual organism in marine sediments, Marine sediments, as I've said, are full of a lot of different types of microbes, so the different colors would be different types. So what we do is we can physically separate out one cell from all these things. This is amazing. We do it with flow cytometry, but basically we aspirate the cells so that there's just a small enough water droplet to allow just one cell to be in it. And then we shoot a laser at it, usually sometimes two lasers, and we look to see whether it has the right fluorescence and also whether the light scatters correctly to identify it as containing a cell. And when that happens, we either flick it with a little puff of air or somehow to get that one droplet with one cell into its own tube. And then we move on to the next one so that we have a big plate with a bunch of individual wells. Each one has just one tiny little microbial cell in it. Then we break it open and try to get its genome out. We do this with enzymes or we do it with pH. Um, there's different ways you can break open a cell. Then, because no one can really do single molecule work, which at this point there's just one molecular copy of a genome in the, in the tube, we have to make a bunch of copies of it. And we do this with an enzyme that got pulled out of a virus years ago and is now used as a workhorse to just make tons and tons of copies of a genome. And then we can send it off to sequencers. We actually sequence the DNA. Now we're in computers, so we don't have to worry about the bench top anymore. And we use algorithms to knit together these individual reads into a whole genome. And so at the end of this, what we get out of it is a list of all the genes that are present within a single type of organism that's in this mixed community. And genes are good because they can tell you, you can see them like a menu for what the microbe is capable of. You can read all the functions that are probably happening for that microbe. Um, so one of the things that we found um, with this sort of hands-off, no, no big hypotheses, just look at them and see what's there, is that we found a bunch of things called toxin-antitoxin genes. So um, this is a plot showing the presence of toxin-antitoxin genes in some organisms, and the, this blue organism right here contains quite a few of them, um, or actually this is the organism right there. Uh, this thing is mycobacterium tuberculosis. So there's this thing that happens in biology that you may not know about, but it's insane, but it happens, where there is a microbe will produce toxins that kill itself. Like, they just make it, just all the time. And the only reason why the toxins aren't killing the microbe at all times is that it simultaneously produces the antidote for that toxin. And this sounds like a terrible idea. Like, why just not produce the toxin at all? But they don't. They, they do this. So they produce this toxin-antitoxin system. And what it means is that they can regulate their cell growth. So they can kill themselves a little bit. They can sort of knock down all their um, cellular functions and slow everything down. So this is a highly studied thing simply because mycobacterium tuberculosis, as you might know, 
will become a chronic illness in your body. And one reason why it's such a pest, it's so hard to get rid of tuberculosis, is that it has all these toxin and antitoxin genes. So it just sits there and does nothing in your body. And you can hit it with all the antibiotics you want, but it doesn't care because it's not growing. We found these same genes all over our microbes in the deep subsurface. This is the number of genes that we found in our different, different groups of microbes. In fact, we found some that had as many as Mycobacterium tuberculosis has. So what this means is that this is probably an adaptation of these deep subsurface microbes to ultra, ultra slow growth. And this may be one of the ways that they managed to do that, achieve that feat. So um, what we know is that in this community, everyone's starving. Uh, because the food is 8,000 years old, and there's not much you can do about that. But now we have found an adaptation to genetically be programmed to avoid growing too fast. And that's a good way to survive if there's not much food around. Um, but what do they actually eat in order to stay alive? Like, how do they subsist? What are they eating down there? How does this even work? And to do that, we applied another cool technique, um, which is called metabolomics. And this is um, done in the um, lab here uh, at my university, the uh, University of Tennessee, with Sean Campagna. And what this is, is basically just a way to get every single small organic molecule out of one sample in one place. So this would be intermediates and metabolism inside cells. This would be potential food molecules outside cells just everything. But normally, people do this kind of technique on cultures or on cell tissue. They don't do it on sediments, on mud from nature, which is, I don't even know how, well, before I did this work, I didn't know how you would pick this apart. Like, what do you do with that much information from this messy natural community? But I tell you, the only reason why I did it, and if you ever think that science is prescribed or follows a logical path, sometimes it just happens because you've got a buddy, Hector, who would come and hang out with me and say, Karen, you got to put some of these amazing samples in our mass spec and try this. And I was like, Hector, it's crazy. I don't want to try to interpret this data. It's going to be so hard. And he's like, no, 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 just do it. Just do it. I was like, OK, cool. <laughs> Here's a bunch of samples. Run them. Why not? And <laughs> so I asked him later, I was like, OK, all right, Hector, did it work? Did they, did they, how do they look? And you know, normally, this is, a, this is a map of the kind of data they get. They get thousands and thousands of, of um, molecules out of this thing. They just get vast quantities of, data, quantities of data. And he said, I'm sorry, Karen, it didn't work. I was like, well, you know, I figured. It's marine sediments, nothing ever works. And he said, we only got 20 metabolites. 20, 20, that's way more than zero. I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, this is perfect, thank you. And, and it ended up being really, really cool. Um, I'm not going to tell you about all 20. <laughs> that would be a whole talk. Um, but I will tell you about one that we found. It's called allantoin. And this is a um, nitrogen-rich molecule that's actually the product of the breakdown of DNA. So when things die in sediments, which dying things are good food for other things, um, their nucleotides, their DNA, will sometimes break down to allantoin. And it's not a molecule that I ever thought about in sediments before, but we, it just popped up. And this is just showing, this is a heat map showing how much of it we got and the different depths at these two sites. And you can just see that all of these little boxes are pretty red, so we got it pretty much everywhere. So now the question is, if this is a food source, because this is one of the only things that popped up, who's actually eating it? Well, we have all the genomes, so we can look and see who has the genes that are necessary to eat this weird thing that we just found. And lo and behold, one of them, called Atrobacteria, had all the genes necessary to eat this food source. And they also seemed to have transporters for it, so they could bring it inside the cell. So suddenly, it became really apparent that Atrobacteria and none of the other microbes were able to take up this allantoin from the environment and eat it, theoretically. Um, so, that's cool, that's one thing, but what about the rest of things? So like, what about normal food, like sugars? Um, so for this, I collaborated with some colleagues at the University of Tennessee, Drew Steen and Jenna Schmidt. And what they did was they made custom enzyme assays to look at consumption rates of sugar. So things that can, can't eat um, uh, allantoin could potentially eat this, just sugars that are out there. Um, and what they found is that the enzyme um, activity rates were pretty low, but there were some activities for things like beta-glucosidase and, and acetyl-glucosaminidase um, 
sugars were being eaten in these sediments. And then when we map this against the genes that we found to see who were eating these different substances, what we found was that this red guy right here, the Asher bacteria, had the highest amount of genes necessary to eat these sugars. So not only were they eating all the allantoin, they were eating all the sugars too. So they were just kind of the winners, um, which makes you wonder if these guys are the best at eating all the food, then why don't they just kill everyone else, eat them, and win the whole game? Like the rabbit versus the hare, or the tortoise versus the hare. This is a bit of a conundrum. Why is the community so diverse? Um, so if you look at everything mapped out in this genome for Atrobacteria, um, we found that it actually has all the genes necessary to have a fully functional metabolism, and we found lots of evidence uh, that it's functioning. Um, they seem to be producing amino acids themselves. They're making amino acids are the building blocks of all the proteins in our cells. Um, but what we wanted to know is, of all these functions that they're doing, which are the ones that are the most um, heavily in use? So to do this, um, we went to metatranscriptomics, which I worked with with more colleagues, uh, Laura Zinke at the University of Southern California and Brandy Reese at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Um, and what they found for what was actually in use for these cells was kind of shocking, and that's that the second most transcribed or heavily used protein in this organism was an amino acid exporter, like to spit this highly energetically enriched molecule. They're in a starving environment. There's nothing to eat. Amino acids are a great food source, and they can what you, they're what you can build your cell out of. And instead of just hoarding it and keeping it, they're spitting it out. That's pretty weird, because I don't watch apocalyptic movies, except for one. I saw this one. Did you guys see Zombieland? It was actually good. <laughs> Maybe I like apoc apocalyptic movies, but I learned that Woody Harrelson's character had to get a lot of guns, because when you are facing massive scarcity, the thing to do, we know from all these movies, is you hunker down, you hoard your stuff, you try to keep all your own goods to yourself, and you shoot anyone who tries to take it from you. That's what, what apocalypses do to people. But here we have the most extreme apocalyptic environment ever. There's nothing to support life, really, just the barest minimum. Um, and they're spitting it out. <laughs> um, and I'm not trying to say that, that, that microbes are nice or care about each other, because that's ridiculous. Um, but it could be that they don't want it to build up in their cells. Because if they have too much of this important molecule growing up in their cells, then they'll have to divide. And if they make a new cell, then that cell is going to compete against them. So maybe they have to spit it out just to keep from dividing, to keep growing slowly. And this could have the knock-on effect of supporting everybody else in the environment, too. So this could be our answer for how, under extreme scarcity, we have this big-time winner who somehow doesn't take over. Maybe just to save itself, it ends up doing something that feeds everyone else and supports this massive community. Um, so, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> So I, I think this is kind of a, a, a nice thing to think of, um, that uh, maybe the short-term apocalyptic response is to get your guns, but for real professionals at apocalyptic living, um, <laughs> the answer is to share and be nice. <laughs> so just a couple more thoughts. Um, you know, this, is, this presents a real evolutionary conundrum for us, <laughs> because these things are getting buried, buried and buried and buried, and nothing really happens. Um, how do you adapt to survive burial for this long? Um, you can actually uh, imagine that if, so normally, if, so like a tree survives with very little growth through winter, and it's because in the summer they get to pass their genes along to the next generation, and we know this happens and that's okay. Well, when summer, when does summer happen for these organisms? Um, up at the surface sediments, they can come back, they get kicked up in a storm, or like a, a burrowing animal pulls them back up, so they could get a chance to like get their genes back in the gene pool. What about that really deep stuff? Why, what's the adaptation to, to being that long? And I, I will say it's possible there's no payoff, it's just random, they just happen to do it. I don't know. I think it's weird to have organisms that are like adapted to do a thing without any natural selection um, causing it. But, 
This is the part that I think is kind of crazy to think about, but remember I just said these things live for thousands of years. So now we have biology that is functioning on geological timescales. So maybe we need to look to geology <laughs> to see what their payoff is. So now, if we remove the cap on our brains and allow ourselves to think of what happens over very long timescales, then if you are riding an oceanic plate te tectonic plate, eventually you're going to hit I heard C4 spreading, and that's right. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to hit a continent, and that's going to happen in a subduction zone. So these oceanic sediments run into continents and get pushed down, and this is certain death down here because this is way too hot for a microbe to live. However, in the early stages of this crust hitting against a continent, there are plenty of opportunities for this stuff to come rushing back to the surface. This is a hypothesis. I actually have not thought of a good experiment to really prove it yet, so I don't know if I ever will or if anybody ever will, but theoretically, because these things are so long-lived, they can make it back in the early stages of subduction. So they actually could be brought back into the world through geological methods, um, which would be, I think, truly amazing. Um, but we'll see. Maybe we'll figure that out someday. But at least it means that um, when we think about these dying populations, they're not just on a one-way road to hell. They can come back. <laughs> um, so maybe it's not so sad. So um, I have no idea how much time I took because I'm not sure what the time hope is appropriate, but my talk is over. So I'd like to thank <laughs> all these amazing people. <laughs> That's fine time. <laughs> Go to the mic. What do you mean by there are so few organisms in the ocean? Well, I mean, when they subduct, yeah. I mean, that's what percentage of the total volume of the organisms are in the ocean. So, yes, some of these... Oh, I see what you're saying. I know. But think of... Whew. <laughs> Just think of... Not... I'd say, I'll we'll be back. Okay. Am I, I'm not mic'd anymore, am I? Okay, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Um, it doesn't take that many of our, not that many of our ancestors had to survive to make us be here today. So it's, it seems a little sad, but you actually don't need that many coming back up to pass genes along and do natural selection. Nature is mean. Let's go to this side. So sad. Can you turn on the microphone? We don't have the microphone on yet. You can, oh, does this one, it sounds funny. Should I take this off? Is that freaky? No, it's not. I'll probably see what it's like. Okay. Why did I choose this field? Um, that is a great question. <laughs> um, I think that I um, chose, I don't know what to call this field that I'm in, actually, um, but I did oceanography. Should I just not? Okay. Walk away. Is it that? Is that the problem? Okay. So I did, um, I did oceanography for my PhD, and that was on purpose because I grew up at the coast and I knew that that was a really fun place to work. But it's because I took so much biology and chemistry and physics in college, and I loved them all equally. And I couldn't pick a field, so I picked a place instead. <laughs> and then I got to do all of the different types of science in the ocean. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm wondering if anybody's looked at the carbon isotope ratios at each stage of these organisms, and has anybody attempted to CRISPR the toxin antitoxin genes into other organisms or organisms that 
Yeah, yeah, yes to both. The, the question is, do, have we looked at the stable carbon isotopic ratios of anything in the system, and also have we moved some of the genes from these organisms into something where we could express it and study it? Um, the carbon isotopes are a whole story. Um, we use them routinely to figure out what processes are happening, and it's, it's really kind of fascinating. Um, but the, um, to move the genes into another, you actually don't necessarily need to use CRISPR-Cas. I don't think that I don't know if people have tried that, but we've done this, where we take some genes where we have a hypothesis about what they do in these strange organisms, and my, through my colleagues at Argonne National Labs, we actually were able to get them growing nicely, or produ being produced nicely in E. coli, and we found that they had a slightly different substrate preference um, that hadn't been seen for that class of biomolecules. But I think that that's a direction that we need to spend a lot more time on, because I think it could be very fruitful. I don't know. Is it on? No. Yeah. It is. I'll repeat you if people can't hear it. So, okay, all these, all these microbes, um, a couple of things I'm interested in. One, where is how, the diversity of it? I mean, I think you mentioned that. Where, how do you get this diversity? Um, what's the genesis? I mean, do you have the comets or the beavers? And, um, this kind of makes it reasonable to think that on other planets there may be stuff like this that we can't see on the surface, such as Mars or whatever. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the question is, how did we get all this diversity of microbes? I mean, 3.8 billion years is actually a really long time. Um, so that's basically how we got such a diversification. Um, it didn't, I mean, it's possible that we got it a different way, but that's enough time to equal all these many different things. But when I think about life that exists outside of Earth, which I think we should all be thinking about, I don't think about it being on the surface of anything, because we don't know of any good, at least within our solar system, there's nothing else with an atmosphere like we've got. Like our atmosphere is like a blanket, and nothing else has that. So if you want to have a protected place for life to be, you've got to look inside these planets. So I think it's a much higher percentage. Is it homogenous? Did you say these things are homogenous all over the planet? The sediments? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. So we're just kind of getting a handle on that. Um, to some level of, well, you have to define what you mean by same versus different if you're going to talk about the distribution of microorganisms. So to some level, they're the same. Like, we can get the same phyla in the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. But on a much smaller scale, like species, we definitely see different things in different places. That's for sure. For this side? If there, if there are... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that is not a silly question at all. How do you define dead? <laughs> um, I personally, my definition for alive is that they are metabolizing even a little bit. Like if there is a molecule that is being passed around to get energy and there's some chemical transformation happening, then I say they're alive. So you're actually, you're measuring some activity yeah, so we don't measure that in real time usually in lab. Um, so we can look at, because marine sediments layer so nicely, we can use um, depth as a proxy for time, and we can look at the rate of utilization of different types of chemicals. So that's one way that we can do it. Um, but actually, there are a couple of these um, deep, like really crazy phyla that have recently been cultured. So they can be cultured. You described the, uh, almost a menu of the different kinds of microbes Spoke of at least one CO2 eating microbe, and the other oil eating microbe, yeah. and so on. What do you see as the, uh, lack of better word, opportunity to utilize some of these microbes or to engineer some of the, what you discovered, maybe there are other things you discovered, in addressing CO2 emission, pollution, other, other scourges? Yeah. <laughs> I think, there are, I think we should absolutely be looking at this new treasure trove of biological capabilities for solving some of humanity's problems. I think we can mine it for good things, for sure. Anything you mine that seems like it's at hand. 
Yeah, well, I mean, they, they are a natural sink for CO2. So that's, that's sort of a, a different, pro this is more the DCO-related project that, that we've been working on. Um, they seem to be doing, do a pretty good job of sequestering CO2. Um, then it's more of an engineering question of how you deliver it to them. Yeah, I don't know much about how, so he asked, is what we're seeing, could it uh, contribute to the production of hydrocarbon over the eons? Um, I think, I don't know that these organisms produce many hydrocarbons themselves, um, but if they were produced around them, they could certainly eat them. Okay, why don't we do one more question here? Speak loud. Yeah. I'm seeing my signals from the back here. Um, so, if you're... So, if the microbes do reproduce when they, when they meet the subduction zone and pop back up, how do you propose they get back into the sediment? Right. Um, so that part is a little bit easier. So if you get popped up to the surface and you get to divide, um, then it's more surface processes. So I think that there's, again, if you give it a longer time scale, then there's lots of um, chances to move sediment around in a local area and push things offshore. And even on a slightly longer time scale, you can have slumping and movements of sediments and canyons and things. All right, one more. Uh, could the differentiation of microbes have something to do with what's coming in from outside of our solar system, such as, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, whatever it hits the Earth? You mean galactic cosmic rays? Or do you mean particles? Asteroids? Asteroids? Yeah, meteorites. Meteorites, okay. for instance. Yeah. That the differentiation could actually be not just what is happening on this earth, but what is coming in from outside of the earth. And also take into account that when you're talking about the oceans and it being sediment, that's changed multiple number of times over the centuries, hasn't it? Where the oceans are and where they're not. So when you say sediment, was that really sediment, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. So to the second question, like we can map where the plates have moved and we know the sediment age, so we know if it was ocean over top or not. We actually use that to our advantage sometimes. We look at places where it's changed. Um, but as far as saying whether all of life on Earth or some of life on Earth came from outside of Earth, that hypothesis is always open. Hard to disprove. Okay, shall we thank Karen? Thanks. Yeah.